we often can go so far astray from what is what truly actually matters at the end of the day. Mm. And we, we say we're all about the gospel and about Christ, but really we're looking for those things that make us feel good, um, which often is seeing our church building full of people or putting on mm. a good show, putting on a, a, a great Christmas service, something like that. Um, when really what we should be, what should excite us and what should be the main thing is, is the gospel in Jesus. Hey, welcome to Pastors with Pour Overs. We're doing a bonus episode. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a different format this time because we're going to be talking about some stuff outside of the uh, 1689 and it's a little different because uh, I don't have any coffee. Do you, Cody, still have coffee? We're doing these back to back nope. with an episode we just did. Cody has a Coke. I have a half empty bottle of Coke. I have <laughs> a I full <laughs> bottle, water bottle here. Nice. So. I should probably have a water bottle. Now we're just dudes with drinks or something. Yeah, not pastors with porovers anymore. Basically, what we're talking about today, we're just going to get right into it because we kind of want to uh, just have a conversation about this, kind of riff off of some things um, because it's something we've been talking about personally a lot in our lives. And um, we've noticed online as well, there's been quite the conversation around this the past few months. Um, but we want to talk about deconstruction um and the kind of institutionalization or organization business like uh stuff with the church and um maybe a little bit of the hyper masculinity is what you would call it cody probably mm. something like that um yeah. all within the context of a podcast that's become really popular over the past few months called the rise and fall of mars hill that uh, Christianity, Christianity Today has produced. Um, so like many other people, we have been listening along, and like many people as well, we have been waiting incredibly long for each of the previous few episodes. That is no shade thrown there. But um, we finally have the full series available for us, and we've both listened to the whole thing now. Um, and um, we aren't making this episode really as like to try to like here's our opinions on the Mars Hill podcast and why we're right and why everyone else is wrong it's not really our, our goal in this but um basically in our conversation about it, as we've been listening to it um these kinds of topics have been brought up and they're things that we talk about on our podcast every every now and then and topics we're pretty passionate about so um we've realized that it's quite the um I, you could call it an illustration or, I guess, background to a lot of these types of conversations. Um, so, Cody, do you want to introduce, um, for anyone who may not know what the podcast is about, what Mars Hill is, who's Mark Driscoll, who cares? What the, what the Rise and Fall podcast yeah. is about or what yeah. our podcast yeah, okay. is? Um. No one cares what ours is. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rise of Fall, if you somehow don't know, because it's much more, it's like when the top five podcasts on Apple or something right now, and um, everyone's been listening to it, but it is a podcast. It's almost, it's almost in like a true crime format, which I've been really enjoying, but it's just exploring kind of the history and ultimately the downfall of Mars Hill Church, which was a massive mega church with satellites and all that satellite churches not in space satellites satellite dishes that, that we know of um satellite tv huge, 100 channels yeah <laughs> huge church in seattle which uh we i mean we're canadian but doing ministry like really right across the border like even like we we'd say vancouver but even the suburbs we're in like I did, i've done most of my ministry life in surrey which is the border like we're right across and we've seen the influence like there's it was big i don't yeah it was a huge influence in church culture like in the pacific northwest even reaching into canada and i think across the u.s maybe across canada a little bit i don't know if the east 
East kind of does its was, own thing. Like I grew up in a, Ontario and when Mars Hill was mm. like, I mean, a thing, first of all, but was really in its like, it's prime and big in that like, oh, I don't know, it'd be like 2007, 2005 to 2013 ish or whatever. Mm. Um, I was living in Ontario, going to church and everything. And we all were hearing about Mark Driscoll, Mars Hill Church. I was listening to his sermons on there. I knew a lot of friends who did as well. Um, uh, there was even like, um, I know you're going to talk about like kind of your experience with it, but one of uh, my experiences with specifically Mark Driscoll was that um, him and James McDonald and Matt Chandler, I think Eric Mason um, did a, a, a conference called Act Like Men. I don't know what year. Mm. I think it was like 2012, 2013. And um, it was like, oh, these are the guys who are like huge right now. And Driscoll obviously was like, uh, arguably the biggest of them all. And so I remember um, we we couldn't stay for the whole conference, but we really wanted to see Driscoll. So we made sure that we stayed that Saturday morning to listen to Driscoll. And this dude walks out on stage with these massive like chains in his hands, like literally like big chains and just like throws them on the pulpit. And he's like, all right, man, let's get down to this. And he just starts like going off on us in Driscoll style. And he's like, has these chains as this like illustration. I was like, like cheering and whatever. And like, just all into it and stuff. Thought it was so yeah. cool that I was seeing Mark Driscoll live. But um, yeah, even in Ontario, like far away from, from Seattle, um, he was, he was a big deal. And then, uh, and then when I moved out to Vancouver for and did ministry there, I could definitely see the the impact that um, Mars mm. Hill Church had on the area. I remember there was a time where I like any connection, like like I have friends whose friends were on staff at Mars Hill and stuff like that. So I was like, Ooh. oh, I know a guy who knows a guy. <laughs> it was interesting because there was a point where that was like point of pride and then it became kind of like an awkward tension thing mm -hmm. and in some ways like I think early on especially like it, it made me feel like I didn't have a right to say anything about it because it's like wow this influence of Mars Hill has been destructive in this way it's like well you realize like Zach over there was part of it and like he's going through this and stuff like that and I was like, that's fair. I guess I'll shut up. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, yeah, it, I think it's, there's been an space. And I think honestly, like we need to recognize the influence it's had on the church as a whole in our mm. personal stories. Um, and we're not just to capitalize, like I could see this people watching us and being like, oh, another podcast trying to like, tag mars hill so that they get more listens but we're we're more wanting to talk about that like hyper masculine machismo culture which is cool that I, I didn't know you went to the like act like men thing i didn't get to go to anything like that i grew up in the middle of nowhere so i never went yeah. to anything like once the the internet became more of a part i started to watch things which is also part of like because mars hill really pioneered like sermon podcasts and that sort of thing and that's one of the reasons why i was like the first celebrity pastor i really was familiar with um but we really want to focus in on that like toxic masculinity i guess that's kind of it's means it's different things in different circles and then over professionalization ultimately how that leads to deconstruction but mm -hmm. i mean i guess just for to kind of get into it I'll share a little bit of my story and I, you give us a little bit from yours, but you can talk more too. Um, I came to like lower mainland BC for Bible college in 2011, which I think was pretty well the glory days of Mars Hill. Mm -hmm. Like that was sort of like listening to the podcast. I feel like like already some shady bad things had went down but it was still at that point where they were growing and things were going well. And I don't know when did, cause I know Johnny Mac, Mr. MacArthur called out 
when was like strange fire and stuff there was a <laughs> yeah it's a strange fire uh, that was like yeah around like 2012 2013 something yeah like that. okay because i feel like nobody had else had really spoken out against mars hill when i first like really was into it mm. and listened to the things um but yeah when i started when i showed up at bible college legitimately the first or second day someone was like are you a calvinist or an arminian and i was 100 percent an arminian but i had no idea i didn't know what that means but i saw there's like this group within the bible college of all the like big guys who were like we ride motorcycles and we work out all the time and we're overly aggressive and we're rude to women and they were the calvinists and in my mind that's what calvinism calvinism was i was like calvinism mm -hmm. is like macho man theology and i sort of like toyed with it and like sometimes those guys would like it's like they're trying to convert me they'd be like come to this man event with me and i was like oh yay i get to be part of the big guys but then at the same time like i was I was a nerd. I was so, so skinny back then. Like, like doctors were like, eat more type skinny, which I wish I had that problem. No, no, I don't. I wish I was more that direction now. Now doctors are like, can you stop eating? Um, <laughs> but I was so skinny. I couldn't grow a mustache hair to save my life. I was a music kid. Wasn't especially good at it. I was into video games. I could barely talk to girls unless they were in the same theater program as me. So I was like on the outs of this group and it was cool that when they'd like bring me into things, but that was very much what I thought was like peak manness in ways and uh, might be getting ahead of myself. But one thing that was really revealing, I think was one time just standing around with a bunch of these guys, I was like, Hey, do any of you guys struggle with pornography? And every single one of them did. And it was almost like, like I just leveled the playing field in a moment by asking this question. And I was like, well, let's start real accountability. And that was something too that I think was a trend, like men with accountability. And what, like there's a lot of lack of accountability in the Mars Hill story, but... I think mm -hmm. one thing I'm realizing now as I get older and more experienced in ministry is that often when we talk about accountability, what we mean is we, we just verbalize things and then have zero accountability. Like even saw a meme recently that was like, like the point of the meme wasn't that it had a crappy understanding of accountability, but they're like, Hey man, I messed up today. And someone replies, it's okay. The grace of God. And like, wow, thanks. So glad to have an accountability buddy. I'm like, that's not mm -hmm. accountability at all. Accountability is mm -hmm. going, well, what were you doing? Were you alone? What, like what led to you messing up today? How, how can you like, let's repent of it. And how can we guard against it? Like, how can we take it seriously? How can we, put that sin to death um but that was an interesting thing where like realizing all these machismo guys all kind of like soft struggled with a similar similar sin a similar downfall and that really leveled the playing field but i remember yeah i think I, like i'd seen a lot of sermons i felt like a little bit uncomfortable with some of the things because it was just so not me and there's a lot of this like you're not a man if if blank and i was like oh i'm not a man oh no i need to totally change mm -hmm. everything and and weird things about like money too like one thing i've seen a lot not even from marcel directly but even just from other like be men thing is they're like uh you can't get married until like you make more than twice your monthly expense and income and I'm like if you like me have a bible college education and you're not a lead pastor of a church and you live in the Vancouver area, that is physically impossible. And, yeah. But that was like an, an, a point of emasculation. And you'd see like, uh, I mean, elephant room was like a whole nother thing. But I remember the discussion with Driscoll and McDonald in, in the elephant room, like YouTube show, whatever you want to call it, where they're talking about like 
money and it was just like really discouraging and deflating like if you're poor you're not a man it's like wow okay mm -hmm. but for me but what was, was kind of attraction oh yeah like that was that was the whole attraction of of driscoll and and the movement was that like people saw him as someone who was just kind of saying stuff that a lot of people were insane mm. and uh, you know like like you were saying with accountability like a lot of people were just kind of like like this false sense of accountability and be like it's okay you're, you're all good and then driscoll gets out there and, and says actually you suck and yeah. you need to grow up and be a man and stuff and to a lot of like guys especially that's like it's an attractive message for someone to call you to something more than just you know being whatever and yeah. that's where the, when the draw was for it right there's a lot he said and we hear it and we we were texting about it in like the early episodes of the podcast and they have clips of things he's saying and i'm like it's actually really good like i hate to say it but what he's saying is really good it's really right and, mm -hmm. and one of the things that really like stuck with me was that yeah i grew up in uh like a you know potpourri in the bathroom everyone has gray hair like it's the worship sounds like you're at a funeral like just lame church and mm -hmm. this sort of idea that that's what church had to be and i felt so out of place i remember like the first time i played on the church worship team my guitar was like this jackson v guitar which looks is like a heavy metal looking guitar and I was so scared to hold it on stage because I thought people were going to like assume badly about me. So I wore like a suit. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to wear a tie, mm -hmm. button up and dress pants and dress shoes. Because like I need to like offset my metal guitar. And then there's this guy who's like, no, heavy metal's cool. Punk rock's cool. And I was like, oh, it's my people. And that's a thing that I think a lot of people like me and we'll, we'll talk about deconstruction too but a lot of people kind of in my tribe in a way in that sense like these punk rockers these metal heads those people were drawn to that and then now that mm -hmm. mars hill's dispersed they don't really have anywhere to land in a church yeah. and especially we see, we'll see like it felt like some of the messaging of the podcast, like every every story has their media bias. We have bias. We're biased towards Calvinism. <laughs> We've said that before. Um, but like every media story is going to have their bias. And it felt like the bias was like the solution is soft, warm, fuzzy rainbows Christianity. And yeah. that's like the alternative to everything wrong with Mars Hill. Yeah. Well, and, and we, yeah, we can show our cards and be like, like we are both complementarians and we're reformed, mm -hmm. um, and everything in our theology. Um, and, uh, yeah, there was portions of the podcast where he was just trying to basically dunk on complementarianism and try to treat that as the root of the issue when that really wasn't it. But we, and you know, you, we mentioned like to toxic masculinity and stuff. And that's a phrase that just gets thrown around these days as some, as, I don't know, like being male is toxic or mm. whatever, right? But um, what is more talking about is this like complete beatdown of of women in the church, which um, uh, we, you know, in the podcast, you hear stories of that and uh, of how some of the women felt uh, about how Mark spoke and how um, one of the, the last episode, it was long, it was so long. Um, but like, as I was listening to it, like one of the heartbreaking things was like t hearing the stories of when, um, you know, when a, this one lady particularly um, was having really tough time with her husband. I can't remember the specific of what happened, but basically I was listening to her story. And I was like, oh man, that's a awful situation for her to be in as a wife and um the husband went to the elders and like apologized and then the pastors were like brought the the wife in and were like you need to accept his apology and you need to kind of move on and and that idea of headship being like as long as the guy just acknowledges it it's okay is like the toxic we're talking about where you're taking advantage of that role that that God has put in place, like the role of a man leading a household and and leading in the church, um, you're taking advantage of that for you know your own benefit, basically. 
Yeah. I lost you for a sec because I accidentally switched internet networks apparently, but but I think one thing, yeah, like our our hearts ached when we heard those stories, like is is actually empathetic people, which is not remotely unmasculine, despite what some of that <laughs> culture likes to tell us. Like, yeah, we heard for those people those stories, it was messed up. And one thing that I've found myself saying, well, because I've been on the defensive as a complementarian for years, like um, like that's been a point where like I've been like soft asked to leave churches over being like saying I'm a complementarian without even like expressing any of its views, just the fact that people knew that on paper that's my view. Mm -hmm. And one thing I've been fighting for is that people like that, that's actually authoritarian. That's this idea that men are are superior, that men are are dominant. That's not what complementarian is supposed to be about. Like, and it's really, mm. it's really disgusting, but it's one of those things where like, um, like I did a paper a long time ago on scientism and scientism is this idea that the only, the only thing that can be true is what can be proven by science. But s people who hold to that don't call, call it scientism. They don't call themselves scientismists or whatever. Like that's always used as a derogatory term. And I feel mm. like that's what's happened with authoritarian theology is like nobody wants to be known as authoritarian. So they just kind of say, oh, we're complementarian. And then it, it blurs mm. the lines and it's really unhealthy. Yeah. But. Um, oh, shoot. I did something else I was going to say. with The toxic masculine thing. Oh, well, I guess just like for me, a real breaking point with like you know, sipping the Kool-Aid of Mars Hill was someone sent me a sermon of, of Mark's, of Mark Driscoll's, and he's like, just r ripping on guys that play video games. And I was trying to find the quote, and it was something like, you know, we have these pansies who, who'd rather play video games than go to a monster truck show. And I'm like, what a pointless thing to say. Well, and for mm -hmm. one, like, I'm down for either of those. <laughs> but like it's, it doesn't make it's just so pointless like what an absolute like pointless thing to have said from a pulpit and mm -hmm. i think that is like a disgrace it's just an absolute abuse of the pulpit but um oh when i heard that i was like well i play video games occasionally does that make me not a man and it's like you need to play sports and i'm like i'm the most like awkward and physically like an inept person, like I'm, I'm not going to play football. I would die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and, but that's this really narrow view of what masculinity was. And it became like a, a matter of faith and, and salvation. And that was when I heard that sermon, I was like, something's wrong with this guy. Like that's, yeah, that's not right. And that really bothers me. And uh, yeah. And that, that's when I remember too, actually, is hearing that one because it like little clips went online like i remember there was one about him talking about like twilight and young adult novels and stuff and how they're weird mm -hmm. and creepy and it's like funny because he's like you're like uh this is funny he's making fun of young adult novels and twilight or whatever but that one i remember that one too and uh i was probably like 19 20 something like that and uh love video games and everything and i mm -hmm. i heard that and i was like uh, i had a similar thoughts because this is someone who you like you li you listen to and you're like and you look at us like oh they're a solid teacher and whatever and uh and i i actually didn't play video games that much for a little while um because i was mm -hmm. like oh maybe i do need to move on and grow up and and but then like i don't know after a little while i was like i don't even care like I like video games. They're relaxing. Yeah. I, I, they're a way that I can, I can just chill out after a long day of work. And that was like, that was the funny thing is like, I was working full time and everything going through school, but I played video games as well. And when he said like all these guys who play video games and, and aren't taking their lives seriously, I thought that was true, but it's mm -hmm. like, and, and then the opposite of that for, for Driscoll was like, be a hardworking man and provide for your family and stuff. And that's this like kind of like masculine macho thing. But then I was like, well, I didn't have a family at the time, but like, I was like, but I'm doing that. Like I'm working full time. I'm working hard at school. Why can't mm -hmm. I take a couple hours in the day and just chill on like and, and play video games? And so 
um, you know, you, uh, you start seeing the cracks in, in it. Right. And it's, it's mm. just this kind of like, you know, it's when you start viewing this guy as like everything he says is right. So I have to like fall under everything he says yeah. in his teaching. And if I can almost throw some like self shade as, as like, you know, people who, who have been pastors and intend to be pastors continuing. Um, if you know our story, neither of us are, are currently employed by a church, but um, like the, these, some of these guys talk about it. They're like, yeah, chopping wood, hauling trees, breaking boulders. I'm like, you stand on a stage and talk. Like, yeah. And like, this is effectively theater. You're a theater kid. Like, <laughs> like, like, why do you think you're like, yeah, I'm one of the, the guys who have tough, grungy jobs. I'm like, you're really not. Mm-hmm. And it's such a strange, like disconnect in a way. It's like a, a, a tribalism. And I think what justifies these guys inclusion is money mm-hmm. because you'll see like, you can have like, people who just don't even remotely fit into a group will be accepted into the group if they're willing to pay for everything. It's like sponsored friendship. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's strange. Cause I think a lot of like that kind of machismo culture I've seen carried through into a lot of churches, even the years since like still a lot of that, like men act this way, men act this way, but then also ironically from opposite views like i spent some time in a like pretty progressive christianity and there's still a lot of like oh you're a man that plays video games and you think you're a real man like there's a lot of you think you're a real man like narrative and dialogue and rhetoric coming from like the warm fuzzy love Mm -hmm. side of christianity as well Mm -hmm. And, and i think it was not not the like pin at all because i think it's giving too much credit to mars hill but like i th- think locally at least we, it's still a lot of the influence from that like somehow that stuck with people well, well mars hill showed that that kind of messaging works to draw a crowd mm. um and you still see it in guys like who are popular online like um like joe rogan um jordan peterson who are kind of calling men to be like real men and stuff and yeah and and let's be let's be honest though like we uh, i think i can speak for you on this as well like we really do believe that men should step up and be leaders in the home and spiritually for their family um provide for their families like we 100 percent believe that but there's a point where mm-hmm. it gets like super um authoritarian and, and toxic and everything and that's where we saw we see these stories coming out of, of like mars hill particularly and um, even just like lower attitudes of like, you know, men's ministries and churches where they're like, right, we're going to have a ladies retreat where we're going to share our testimonies and paint floral pictures and do mm. uh, do all these crafts. And that, that's like the stereotypical what we make women's ministries be. And then the men are like, we're going to be real men and we're going to barbecue meat and we're going to go fishing for the weekend. And it's mm. like, it's just this, like, it's this funny, like, culture in the church where, you know, we're almost, like, showing, like, there's these distinct, uh, you know, men and women are different, but we've completely stereotyped them into one one type of, of thing, men and women, right? Um, yeah. I, and I think with all this, like, so, you know, there's obviously that huge uh, topic in the, the story of Mars Hill and, and it's kind of continued on in Christianity a little bit. But I think what, I, what we should move on to as well is this whole idea of deconstruction, because one of the, you know, uh, and this is happening all over the place now. And we see people like it seems almost every week saying they've deconstructed or they're in the process of deconstruction or whatever. But mm-hmm. with a with a church as big as Mars Hill was and how it just kind of imploded overnight, basically, um, the years since you just see a lot of people connected to that story in that church who have now said like, yeah, I've deconstructed and I'm no longer a Christian. I don't believe in that stuff anymore. Um, people in this podcast who have said that, um, but even like beyond the podcast, like, um, you have different more public figures from Mars Hill who, who have said that as well. 
Um, mm. I think Dustin Kensrue is one where I don't know. I I don't know for sure if he would say he's like deconstruct or anything, but he's definitely not like what Mars Hill was teaching, right? And he he went through a process of that. Um, yeah. And you know, there's a bunch of more public figures. Uh, the guy from King's Kaleidoscope again. Um, he hasn't deconstructed but a lot of his music talks about that period of time where it was yeah. like a lot of my friends are um jaded from what happened at mars hill and so um when it comes to what we see happen at mars hill um and deconstruction what are kind of your thoughts on that and how it's basically how it's related to like the rest of church culture now and this idea of deconstruction i think a lot of the deconstruction that I've seen of like people personally close to me who are really hurt by either Mars Hill specifically, or just by the culture, like the, the, the over masculine thing, but also like the over professionalization of church, which we didn't talk as much about, but we also have like whole episodes, like we're pretty outspokenly against the over professionalization mm -hmm. of church. I think there's a lot that's legitimate. And I think sometimes People like who have deconstructed have left the faith. Um, they feel like the church is going like, oh, you that's dumb. You're just being shallow or like they're illegitimizing their experience. And I think it is valid. And it, I know it sounds a little bit like the no true Scotsman fallacy, but I think it's because a lot of the times like the church and the gospel got so lost mm -hmm. that what pe and then or so like intrinsically tied to these disgusting destructive things that the person couldn't deconstruct the, from this view of church as a corporation which we agree is terrible without deconstructing their faith as well because the way they gained their faith they were so in, intrinsically tied and and i just i want to say i think if you're listening to this if you made it this far I, I can't imagine many people if if you have deconstructed that you have, but like it's valid, like it's understandable. We have empathy for you that you've questioned things that were in fact illegitimate. And it sucks that we think you've also deconstructed things that were, but we can understand how that happens. Mm -hmm. Um Well, and I think what you what we've seen I mean, in the, again, in the retelling of the story of Mars Hill, but even in our experience as it as happening, like live in front of us, right. In the, in those years was that, um, specifically to Mars Hill, you know, you saw a lot of people attaching themselves to Mark Driscoll, um, and, and him. And so when you see, you know, there is some, there's some shady stuff going on behind the scenes and, and maybe he wasn't the best example for you that you thought he was, um, that really affects someone's faith to look up to this, be looking up to this leader and this guy who's like your pastor and stuff. And this church as well, where it's like, wow, there's thousands of people here. It looks like it's going well. And tons of people are hearing about Christ and, and getting saved and stuff. But everything we were doing was in the name of that. But we were, you know, we were really trying to just build up our institution of Mars Hill or, or the, the name of our pastor um, and so we see that on smaller scales, even now where people become disappointed because, you know, they're a part of a church and the church isn't meeting their needs or like, um, you know, they, they feel like they have this community in the church or their pastor, um, you know, you, you expect your pastor to be empathetic towards you and to help you. And then he fails you. Um, and in those moments, a lot of people, uh, then look at the church and like, well, you know, this is all, it's all garbage. Like what they're teaching mm. is not true. They don't actually believe it. And the, you know, they're not practicing what, what they're preaching. And, um, I can like legitimately say, even in my experience, it's like, yep, yeah, that's a hundred percent. What happens a lot of the times is like churches put up this, this face and, um, this image that, you know, we're super loving and we care for everyone. And, and all this stuff. And then you get disappointed because people let you down. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of people in their stories of deconstruction, um, that's what the root was, is we had so much hope and faith in these people or in this church and in what it was doing. Um, and we realized that like maybe our focus was, was off here. 
we're trying to build yeah. up, even if it's not a mega church, just your local church that you've been a part of for 10 years or whatever. Um, and, and then that moment of failure comes. And that's where like we see deconstruction can be a, a, like a good and valuable thing if it leads to reconstruction. When you mentioned um, King's Kaleidoscope and I think what's cool with that is there was like a season of deconstruction and then like a revival, like a return to faith. And it's just like in a different way and sort of, I can't remember which song it is, but I was reading through the lyrics of one of them recently and it talks about how he was like hiding garbage in his art. And like, you can see kind of the angstiness of like just the previous album before Zeal, which is like this triumphant, um, unless I have this confused, but, uh, yeah, I won even, I, I guess I realized as you were talking about like putting so much confidence and faith in an institution, like even if it doesn't fail or wrong you, like just the way I was raised, I spent most of my like formative years, I guess, in one church. And then when I moved and every church was so different, I never found like a church quite like the one I grew up in. And I never found community like that. And that was hard for my faith because so much of my faith was dependent on this like community where like everyone knew everyone and you're always at somebody's house from the church that seemed like almost every night or at least every weekend and like not having that felt like a, a blow to my faith mm -hmm. and it's like there's no easy answer or easy like solution to be like and it's because i wasn't praying enough or something like there's differences in that we put our faith in the wrong things but also, it, like in the case of Mars Hill, we see there's a, a guy in leadership who just didn't meet the qualifications of an elder. Like he never should have mm -hmm. been a pastor. But he was yeah. platformed because he was charismatic and a good communicator. Mm -hmm. And, and, it's, and it, it, Well, it's like it's stories like this that show um, often where we put what we value the most. And, you know, it's, it's put on like crazy display in a church like Mars Hill, but even in, in our, like so many churches, it's like, we put our value in how good of a speaker is my pastor? How charismatic is he? Is he funny? Do you tell a good story this morning? Is the, is the music mm -hmm. good? How good is the guitarist? Oh, we have a great singer. Oh yeah. He puts out an album. Like those are the things where we're, we're almost measuring how like great, how good our church is. Um, yeah. You know, and like, did we put on a great event? Do we, do we do this? Do we do this? How much money did we raise for this initiative? Um, and it really is like, it's, you know, listening to the story of Mars Hill again and thinking about, you know, my own church experience and, and things I see in church culture. And it's like, we often can go so far astray from what, is what truly actually matters at the end of the day. Mm. And we, we say we're all about the gospel and about Christ, but really we're looking for those things that make us feel good. Um, which often is seeing our church building full of people or putting on mm. a good show, putting on a, a, a great Christmas service, something like that. Um, when really what we should be, what should excite us and what should be, the main thing is, is the gospel in Jesus. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I don't know. I don't know what else I could say to add to that, but yeah, it's, uh, it's so easy to, to lose sight. One, well, one thing I had a conversation after our pastors are not professionals episode. Uh, there's a pastor who reached out to me and wanted to have a conversation. He was talking about this issue. He sees, of we separate um, like the function of the church. Can't think of like the practical day to day from our theology so much. And that like when the way we do hiring and firing and planning, we're not actually considering the reality of Christ and what we believe about the gospel and what he's done and how he's told us to live. We sort of just like think in business world and then think in our theology world over here. And that's how you can have churches that preach a good theology 
but then they don't live it and it's not in their corporate structure and mm-hmm. it doesn't actually like affect anything about the way that they operate. And it's, I, I think hard to see those things, but then, yeah, it's hard to like, it's an easy thing to get sucked into too. Like we don't think we're like the guys that got all the answers and <laughs> we, uh, like if we ran a church, it would be perfect or anything like that. But yeah, mm-hmm. I guess the so- the solution <laughs> to say there's no easy solution, but it, in a way there is a solution is that we need to keep coming back to the cross, keep coming back to Jesus, keep coming back to the gospel, who he is, what he's done for us, who he's made us, and and just be absolutely fixed on Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's often, when, you know, I reflected on all this stuff too. It's, um, I, it's revealed. Um, I mean, even as I like reflect on myself and ministry and things, things I've done and stuff, uh, I can pinpoint moments where it was like, this was truly acting out of a lack of faith in Christ and a lack of like faith in his sovereignty and his power. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I was, we've both done youth ministry a lot and, uh, you know, I did my very, I did my very best to try and make sure that, you know, running the youth groups, the focus was on Christ and on uh, teaching and making disciples and stuff. But there's always those moments where, you know, you have events and you, you think of of this cool event to do and you put it on and maybe you spend a lot of money on it. And you're like, this is going to, okay, they can all invite their friends. We're going to have pizza. We're going to have this sweet game. We're going to do all this stuff. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, you're like, wow, look at all these kids that are here. And you're so excited about that. Um, and you're so excited to see all these kids come in, but then you never see them again. And you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I thought that was really going to work. Like, I thought doing this event was really going to, be the thing that that drew all these kids in and it's showing my lack of faith in in christ and in the gospel and in in god doing his work yeah it's uh if you've listened through all this we appreciate you being here we want to know your thoughts if you've listened to rise rise and fall on mars hill or not if you've experienced these things the hyper masculinity the over professionalization of church if you're going through deconstruction actually i know we have some listeners that are wrestling with these things and we appreciate you um and we'd love to hear from you and to, to talk with you um yeah this is gonna be our last episode before we take a bit of a break for the holidays um so we hope you have a merry christmas and uh that whatever that looks like for you if you get to spend time with family or whatever it is that Hope that goes well for you and we will see you in the new year. Bye.